First, you might say, well, is this the right analogy? And first, I'm not the first one to think about the garden analogy. And the main thing is um, you can't force plants to grow, right? So you can, you can just create the space, create the environment uh, to help them grow. And also there's a bunch of external constraints that you have to deal with. Like maybe there's a storm and maybe there are other thing, external things you have to deal with, right? So it's kind of, you can, it's all about trying to create the environment despite all the other things that are happening and hoping that things are going to happen well. And also if you don't do that, like gardens tend to grow wild or maybe die completely if you don't water your plants and so on. So this, the general idea. So the agenda, I'm going to start by talking a little bit about what is open source because there's like many different definition of what open source is. Um, why we need to tend to the community and some practical advice on how to do this. And, uh, and it's all worth it, right? We, you know, if we do this, it's hard, but we do this because it, we, it makes sense. So on the what is open source, there's a bit of tongue in ching things. Like if you heard people talking about free software, there's always in English, there's two definitions to the word free, right? There's free like in free beer, following my garden analogy. And there's free as in free speech, uh, which is very different. And like Yarek was pointing out, there's also, it's actually free as in free puppy because an open source project, you know, it, give it to you, it's free. You don't have to pay for it, but then you need to kind of make it work and take care of it. So it's kind of like this base definition. And if you think about the most basic definition of open source is you can read the code. And uh, you know, it's like that doesn't mean you can do anything with it, right? By default, the code you're reading, if there's no license attached to it, it's all rights reserved. There's nothing you can do with it. You're not necessarily authorized to do something with it. But then you have licenses, and some of the licenses are more permissive, like the Apache from the, like the Apache license, where you can do anything with it. The only thing you cannot do is pretend you wrote the code and claim it as your own, uh, and you have to give credit, right? And then there are other licenses like GPL, when you actually, if you build on top of it, you also have to make it free. Um, so that's the first level, right? Like what is it that is allowed to do with the code? It's not because it's open source that you can do whatever you want with it. Second level is governance, right? There's a project and governance is about who can control modification, right? Open source, you cannot just like make it writable, a repository writable by everybody because then you're opening yourself to um, whatever happening to it, right? You need some kind of governance. You need some people to be trusted with accepting contribution or not. And you need some process to define who becomes someone who accepts those things. So that's kind of the governance aspect. So it's another thing to look at the open source project. And every version of this is fine. You know, some projects are totally closed. You know, they're open source, but nobody can contribute to it except its creators. And some projects as part of the Apache Foundation have clear governance on how you become a committer or, or so on. And the last part with the foundation, it's really about when a project is part of a foundation, that's where you start saying, well, nobody owns it in particular, right? It's under the umbrella of a foundation, like specifically I'm thinking about the Apache Foundation or the foundations like the LFAI and data or the, um, uh, the cloud computing foundation, the CNCF. Um, and really having rules is like, basically you're saying nobody ever is going to change the license of the project, right? So you can rely on it. You know, there's already going to be some rules about the governance. The project is going to follow certain standards and nobody ever is going to control it and so on. So it's kind of basic definition of open source being different things. And so when we think about the community, right, it starts with the general public. So hopefully if you want to create, to grow your open source system, your open source project, you can talk to everyone eventually. And, but as a smaller group in this, they're just the observer, like people will look at what you're doing. They're not necessarily participating, but they're important because they're the people who are going to talk more like bring more of the general public into it. And then you have the contributors, people who are actually interacting with the project and the maintainers, like people who can actually dis accept a contribution or uh, decide what goes into the project or doesn't go get accepted. And all of those are important and it's really 
you know, it's like really how you grow your community to go from maintainers to getting contributors becoming maintainers, observer becoming contributors, general public coming in and really growing that its community. And there's lots of interesting uh, aspect to this, like contributing or maintaining could be a job, right? Like some people do this when they have time and some people can be paid full time to do things and it's okay. And that's how a lot of those open source projects can actually grow and have a lot of feature is because people are being paid full time to work on it. And there's some of the maintainers role, there's some uh, variation depending on the structure of the project. In the Apache Foundation, you have the committers where the people who have right access to the repository can accept contributions. And the PMC members are more like defining what are the bylaws of the project, can vote on including new committers, um, can uh, vote on uh, releases. And depending on structure of open source project, you know, they can have blurred the lines, you can have one role or you can have more roles depending on how people care about. I put some illustration here of interesting of like changing roles in this, right? So I'm from France and close where my parents live is Giverny, which is if you know Monet, he like he was, he created this garden in his house for painting, right? So he actually diverted some river to have some water as in his uh, garden and growing plants and then became one of his famous subjects. And you know, and then here that's his adoptive daughter, which is a subject and a painter, and he was also building the the garden, right? So there's kind of interesting thinking in this parallel of there are many roles in this, right? And it's kind of, and then there's some legacy of you know those gardens they live forever in his paintings, um, and then kind of, and you can visit those gardens and see and see them for real. You can visit the museum when they see the paintings. And so there's lots of, you know, how we create things, whether it's open source projects or art or, you know, gardens and how you'd move from being a subject for being a painter, from being a contributor to the project. And, uh, oh yeah, the other thing I wanted to point out is like contributions come in very different shapes as well. Like contributions is not just code, right? Like we often think of open source projects as code, but there's lots of, Filing bugs, improving the documentation, fixing bugs, helping others, and depending on how much time or skill, technical skills you have, there's a lot of things you can contribute to a project. And just giving credit, I was chatting with Ross, uh, a colleague, and uh, he shared that that's his diagram that he was sharing as an illustration here. So we talk a bit about open source. Why do we need to tend to our community? So I think the main thing is we have these global distributed communities that need to collaborate to build something, right? And there's lots of friction inherent to global asynchronous communication. Um, it's really hard to give attention to everyone. It's really hard to know how much energy do I put in something I don't know what it is. So there's lots of inherent friction and difficulties. It's just hard to do this. So if you don't pay attention to it, it's not gonna work is often what's happening. And if we, we look at it from the contributor's perspective, often you have, um, you know, you're kind of come to the project and you don't know what you expect. And maybe you're a little kid and you're just watching from the outside and you need someone to give you permission to actually do something. It's like, am I even allowed to contribute? Am I allowed to touch anything? How do these people work? Um, on the other end, you have the contributors that come in, there's like lots of energy and they come with a giant pull request on the project and they say, yeah, this is great, we're going to do things. And you're like, whoa, wait a minute, we have ways to work, you can, don't just do big contribution like this, you don't bring a stick and walk around everything, right? Um, so there's a bit of the contributor's perspective, how hard is it, what's like, how do people work here and like, how do I even be part of this? And then from the maintainer's perspective, you're like, you're here and you have this immense responsibility that you have the entire world as an opinion on the work you're doing, right? Like as this open source project, people are using as like, oh, your documentation is not up to par. Or like, oh, you're not responding fast enough. Which is just like the entire world wants my attention. What do I do with this, right? How do I do this? There's all these children that come to my garden that I'm carefully tending to and they want, they're they walking outside the path and they're just like stepping on the flowers and just don't know how the CI works. 
And it's kind of hard. You have all those things, right? And so it's just, it's just a lot of difficulty. So like now I'm going to go to the more concrete, practical, what do we do about this, right? Like, so it's kind of these, these things, we have limited time. There's like, people don't know what to do. How do we nurture this garden? So I think the first really important things is setting expectations. Like people need to know, um, you need to explicitly set a certain number of things, right? Before you start contributing, how you start contributing, what is expected, how do we get to agree on what we're going to do, how is contribution going to be accepted, before we put, you put energy in contributing something like, how do people figure out what, how much work is going to be, do they know uh, what is going to be. On the using the project, right, there's kind of, if people contribute and if they depend on a change in the project, they need to know, they need to wait for a release to use it, right, so there needs to be some expectation around that. How do we know how this is happening? And then if I put energy in contributing to the project, who gets to decide what gets uh, contributed, what gets published, and how we do this. Um, so setting expectation, there's a lot of effort to be done in reducing friction to contribution. Um, you know, like tooling and processing, like we, when people come in, a lot of things need to be obvious, right? Like if CI is always green, then they know to expect that not to break the build. If it's often broken, like do they know if they broke something or if it's sometimes broken and someone has to figure it out? Like basically removing how much institutional knowledge you need to have about the project when it works, making things really explicit. I have tests that are really uh, gatekeepers to knowing if you broke something or not. Uh, making it easy for people to setting up an environment without having too much knowledge. So it's either encoded in your build system or in the documentation and making all those things really, uh, really clear and things like code owners can help knowing who to reach out to for specific parts of the project. And it, of course, like the main currency of open source is recognizing contribution, giving credit. Um, and this is something that's not a zero sum game. It's really nice, right? It's not because you're giving credit to someone that you're removing it from someone else, right? Like we can really give credit to everyone. Uh, this is really something that is important and that's how, you know, we, we make uh, contributors really being part of the community and part of uh, the success of the project. So on one end, there's reducing friction to contribute. The other end is reducing friction to use, right? Use the project. Because often contributors, for contributors, it's easy to use the project because they know how to build it. They may, they may have their own uh, internal release system. They could do their own thing. So the, the contributors usually have no problem using it or like the main contributors. But it's really important to have a clear, regular release process for the rest of people. We don't do custom CI, we don't do other things, we don't test betas uh, before it's actually officially released. So having a fixed schedule, like a monthly cadence is great. Making the main rents always shippable so that you can really have an easy process uh, to create releases and create a cadence. And some of the things we've been doing, like for example, in the Open Lineage project, is allowing a community to request releases. Like maybe there's a bug fix that just been merged, and maybe it's not that important to some other people, but it's really important to the one person who fixed it, and they really want to be able to use it right away. And so just being able to say, you know, we, I know we are going doing a release next month, but can we just do um, patch release right now with just this bug fix? And if you have those properties, right, it's really easy. So just about pushing a button, creating a release, and uh, and just really having this good cadence and make it really easy for people to depend on it and update the things and so on. And really, like it's about drawing people in, right? Contributors become stakeholders, right? Like so one of the important things is you need to give attention to all these contributors that are coming in, right? And if you want them to have an easy way to contribute, you need to actually give them attention. And the more you give attention, the more people will ask for it, right? So you need to be able to scale. So those contributors, they need to be drawn in 
and become part of the committee, be, becoming stakeholders, being coming themselves able to speak on behalf of the project and give feedback to others and grow the community like this and enabling growing this and making it scalable. So it's really important to me, contributors, there's not like users or contributors or maintainers, right? It's really about they all being constantly drawn into the inside of their circle, right? We are always inciting them to come to the next level, right? So you, you see um, a contributor, the goal is to become, they become like commuters or maintainers and always inciting them to take more responsibility and make them realize, no, you don't have to ask permission all the time, right? There's not like the people who own the project and the others. The goal is to really draw people in and encourage them to take ownership of it. And another important aspect is, you know, like what's an open source project roadmap? Well, there's no roadmap. There's really, because the open source project, it's not owned in this context, right? It's not owned by anyone. There's not like one entity that decides how resources are going to be allocated, who's going to work on what at what time, right? What's important as in the community is that first, we decide what is part of the project mission, right? There's things that clearly make sense for the project. There are things that don't make sense for the project. There are things that are kind of on the border and we need to figure out where it sits, like what part of it makes sense in the project, what part of it, like maybe it's extensions that other people can do. And then this kind of aspect as a community, how do we align on this? Well, and then as, you know, I put we kind of in quotes, which is like, as each stakeholders or contributor in the project is like, okay, what do we need out of it? But what are the particular features from what makes sense for this project? What are the particular features that I'd like to see happen and be added? And then there's like, what we can contribute, right? Like, and so it, then this is the part that's subjective, right? On it, and I guess each contributor could draw this Venn diagram and decide what it means to them. And then what's in the middle? That's what gets done, right? That's the part that it includes people agree it's good for the project, someone needs it and has the capacity to do it. So the middle is what gets done. <coughs> Sorry. And so, yeah, <clears throat> bad move. Um, and so this is really, in terms of the bit, the stochastic aspect of the open source uh, thing is like, how do we, create this consensus on what's good for the project. And you know, and if you think about a lot of those projects that are vendor driven and like vendors collaborating with a project and building product around it, right? The, the other aspect of this diagram are interesting, right? Like, okay, what we need, but we don't have time to do yet. Well, it's kind of the future OSS roadmap. That's what we're going to do. Um, what is not part of the project, but we need and we can contribute, but that's my proprietary product I build on top of the open source project and people pay me for and potentially that's how I fund contributing to the open source project and help it grow. Uh, what's not, you know, part of, I don't need, but I can do and other people need, or maybe it's just services that someone sells, like you can sell you services to help you implement something and so on. And this is kind of a good way, healthy way to think about how do we collaborate on this. Um, but the other aspect is, and it's kind of my last point, um, is that community requires communication, building trust and connection, right? Like we are not just machines that exchange information and you don't just agree on what we're going to do by uh, just, oh yeah, it's just going to be common sense and we I'm just going to make an argument on the mailing list. And, obviously it's going to make sense and people are going to agree with me. So if we're going to be able to communicate, we need to build this trust, right? So I think communication is necessary because we said this is a global distributed community. So we must have async communication to start with at the primary goal. However, it's not the most natural way for human beings to communicate, right? It's not great. You don't get the tone. You don't know what the facial expression of the person writing the email is. And this kind of takes time. You don't all paying attention at the same time. And so sync, but on the other hand, synchronous communication, it excludes people that are in incompatible time zones, right? And in-person communication excludes people that are in different locations. So how do we, how we do a good trade-off between this? 
Right, so my perspective on this, you can really augment async communication by adding synchronicity to it. Right? And so you must have the async communication as a baseline because time zones and location and so on. But at the same time, video conferencing has got a lot better and it helps getting remote people together. Right? And in-person meetups help forming connections. So really adding regular synchronous meetings to this asynchronous communication helps a lot. Forming these connections, getting people to know each other better and collaborate together better. Right, so it needs to be available for the community. Um, you can use various ways of asynchronous communication to agree on what's the best time for a synchronous call online. And you can change the time from time to time so that not always the same people have to do it late. Um, usually, you know, English has been the most common language that people speak, but depending on the open source project and the communities that could vary. And when you do in-person meetups, vary the location so that different people uh, can meet. And it's okay not to participate to all of those, but participating to some of those and creating this connection that will help with the async communication, will help understand each other, especially if we have different culture. And really publishing notes and recording so people can see what happened and really follow up async, you know, use GitHub issues and so on to make decisions and so on. And, and so that's really an important point and it's all worth it, right? That's how you ripe the benefits of the community, it's important work to keep this going and really have good rhythm. And you know, and maybe you build a project that will be known forever, will stay in museums, uh, or you know, that will feed you. Um, like whatever your goal is with the open source project. Um, and this is the house that is still being visited with the garden, and this is one of the paintings of Monet, or you know, producing fruits and so on. So that's my point.